Honorable Sabrina Turner, Minister for Health and Wellness, esteemed speakers and presenters, members of the Healthcare Conference Organizing Committee, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And welcome to the third day of the 14th annual Cayman Islands Healthcare Conference. We're on the home stretch, but there's still a lot of information to pass along in our last few hours together. If you're just joining us, I am Ben Mead. I'll be your master of ceremonies through today's proceedings. I hope that you did enjoy the breakfast that was provided this morning and sponsored by Aetna. We appreciate all the sponsors who have made this year's event possible. Let me just take a moment to say thank you to our main sponsors, Health City Cayman Islands, the Health Services Authority, Doctors Hospital and Integra Healthcare, Compass Media, Kelly Holding Events and Communications, 3T MRI, Ironshore Pharmaceuticals, and DART. Now, before we get started, I'll challenge those of you, whether you've been here one day, two day, or for the entire conference, I challenge you to take away three key takeaways that you can put into action or that you can utilize to help bridge the gap between patient and practitioner. So let's get started now with our first presenter this morning, the Reverend Dr. Yvette Noble Bloomfield. She is the Deputy General Secretary for the United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands and the Cayman Islands Regional Mission Council. Her topic this morning is Healing and Pastoral Care, the Divine Nexus. Let's welcome the Reverend Dr. Noble Bloomfield. Ladies and gentlemen, a very pleasant good morning. I wish to thank the planning committee for accepting this meager proposal, which seemed interjected into this auspicious conference. But I read an article about the conference, and as I sat by my desk, I said, but optimal health must include something around the divine. There must be something around pastoral care and the intervention that can happen. And so I bravely wrote to the planning committee and they boldly accepted. And so I invite you into this space with me. If I were to say, and I know most of you are medical practitioners, if I were to say to you that in 29 years, one person had blunt force trauma, which required 17 stitches to the head, a broken left humerus, two C-sections, partial thyroidectomy, DVT, double pulmonary embolism twice, subdural hematoma, borehole, craniotomy, cataracts removed, and the list doesn't end there. You would want to think whether or not that person is still alive because several on the list should have taken the person's life or could have taken the person's life. What happened for that individual? I'd want to posit that at each juncture, there was a combination of the relationship with God, and I struggled here because at points, it was not the relationship with God alone, but more importantly, the relationship with the medical practitioners and the care of the Christian community. So in this presentation, I want to say that at the juncture of life and death, God the physician, and the care of a community of faith will always be important. Because you see, healing is not just dependent on what happens in the physiological body, but healing is dependent on what happens in the mind and in the spirit. And so optimal health, I humbly submit, must include the work that goes on between not just the patient and the practitioner, the medical practitioners,
but the collaborators with the doctors. I don't need to show my face. <laughs> so optimal health is the desire of every human being. It is the absence of disease, pain, injury, suffering. And I believe it is a pathway to inner peace when the mind, the body, and the spirit are aligned. Optimal health includes a relationship with the divine. And for me, it's a pathway to the best form of living. There are several studies which indicate that Patients thrive better when there is an intervention of faith. And I point, to, to point you to two studies in particular. One which was published in the Journal of American Medical Association in July 2022, a study entitled Spirituality in Serious Illness and Health. And it was done by um, professors at the T.H. Chang School of Public Health and the Bridgman and Women's Cancer Center. And the study linked better health with pa patient care and pastoral presence. And it says that there was a better quality of life when persons understood that their care was not just dependent on the medical practitioner, but on their faith and their relationship with Christ, or with faith. I would also like to point out Herb Benson, the author of prayer, the prayer study at Harvard University, who said, yes, there is a link between prayer and healing. Further, he said, we have scientific proof that prayer affects the body functions and fights stress. Your metabolic rate, heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, and brain activity improves when there is prayer. And so I invite you, if you have not read those studies, to, to look at them because they present the facts around why I am saying to you today that optimal health ought to include a pastoral presence. We know that the healthiest person will get ill at some point in time. It's so sad someone is in the peach of health and there is a motor vehicle accident or there is a shooting or some disaster. And you would say, well, here is a healthy person. But because of these set of circumstances, they are challenged. Or someone may have an underlying condition that they never knew about, but they become ill. So no matter who we are, as young, as beautiful as we are, we may yet face illness. We want to underscore that the medical practitioners will never lose their space as paramount health care givers. And I stand here this morning with every respect for the full medical profession. And I just invite us to give yourselves a hand. Without you, where would we all be? But the relationship with the patient and the doctor needs to be one that is of trust. And on Thursday evening, I think several of the speakers spoke to that, that it must be a relationship of trust. There must be communication. There must be listening. And there must be a time when the, the doctor really understands what the patient is facing. I want to say that physical healing which we can achieve with the work of the doctors and those in the profession. And this is just a list of the medical professions to which I would add the ophthalmologists, the dentists, the psychiatrists. And there might be so many other persons who collaborate with the medical profession. The therapists, the counselors, pastors. And, and as I process this, I said to myself, I must also mention the farmers. Because the doctors are always saying, eat right, eat well. And where would we be without our farmers? And so, and so we all collaborate to make health the best that it can be. I watched 15 television commercials in about a half an hour. And seven were on medical care. Whether some, some drug you are to take, something you are to do. Four were on food, 
restaurants, drink, and then the rest were on technology, car, telephone, pets, insurance, etc. But what struck me was how many spoke to some form of health, which tells me that the population is concerned about health care. And the, the truth is that we as human beings must understand that health care is beyond just our tissues and our organs, we have a soul. And most of my presentation will then go into how does God come to the table when health becomes a challenge. We possess a soul, and it is the soul that connects the human to the divine. It is the seat of love, and it understands hurt, pain, beyond the physical manifestation. The soul is the God space within each of us. And whether or not we believe death is linear, spiral, or vertical, at some point we will all die. And it is always interesting that no matter who dies, what do we hear them say and what do we read on social media? May their soul rest in peace. And sometimes I'm like, okay then. Regardless of the, the manifestations in life, in death, may their soul rest in peace. And so we have this awesome respect for the soul. We also know that whenever anything happens, like the shooting this past week, when the, 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 whether it's the mayor, the governor, the police chief, the medical doctor, our thoughts and prayers are with the victim's family and those who are in recovery. So it then tells me that we have a population that recognizes, whether or not they go to church, temple, mandir, wherever, that prayers, the soul, are critical to who we are. And so when, when it comes to caring for ourselves, we must recognize what happens to us. Where, where we hurt, our emotions are there, we, we have confusion, we are in denial, we get angry, we are bitter, we are discouraged, we are depressed. Some of us ex ex exist in a frame of apathy, some of us exist in a frame of fear. For some people there is hopelessness, for some people when there is illness there is shame, there is guilt. I know most of you would remember the outbreak of HIV AIDS in the late 70s, early 80s. And the shame and the stigma that attended that particular disease. We saw the same thing with COVID, that some people were ashamed that they had COVID and they didn't want to interact and I know all the medical reasons why you shouldn't, but we should not have made people feel that their disease was a point of shame. And for some people, their disease is a point of guilt. And I'm saying that optimal health must help people to get over the stigmatization and the degradation and the marginalization that happens when there is illness. At the, at the core or at the intersection of, of who we are as individuals is that space within us which relates to God. And when we become ill, there is a, a, a dynamic around prayer. Even for persons who don't pray, there is a dynamic around prayer when people become ill. <laughs> I, and I, I am very, very careful um, about respecting um, religions, but I would speak of, say, persons who are Rastafarians who believe in the I and I, but sometimes in that moment of illness, I and I changes into Jah, and then I and I changes into Jesus Christ, as, as there is an appeal now, a desperation for support from within the religious, the further religious community. The, when, when, when persons are going through their, their journey of pain and they are seeking for support, those of us who offer support must never ever discriminate. We must respond to people in their moments of need. And let it not be lost on us that every religion, has a space 
for healing. Every religion offers care. But just to speak to the, the slide that is up for a moment, the, the hospital and the home, and I, and I want to add to this list, hospice or palliative care, provide a critical space for people during illness. And uh, as, I, as I reflected on, on palliative care, that end stage care, so you've gone to the hospital, you've been at home, but now it's really at the end. And I, I salute Jasmine and the work that they do in the Cayman Islands. Because at that stage, people need some responses around, if I'm dying, what's next? If I'm dying, I want to be comfortable. When I die, what is going to happen? I remember my first, as part of my theological training, we had to do field work. And my first assignment was at the Hope Institute in um, Augustown, Jamaica. And my first patient was a young man, he was 25. He had brain cancer. And I was a 19-year-old theological student. And so I went to the Hope Institute and I met him. At that point, he couldn't speak, he couldn't see, he could hardly hear, so it was a lot of touch. And he was, you know, you, you, you know, and it was a Friday, and I'll never forget, and this was in the late 80s, or the late 70s, I should say, I'm that old. It was in the late 70s. And I went into this, this room, and I'm like, what do I do? He can't see me, he can hardly hear me. But here was a young man in need. And so I had to touch, touch him to say, I'm here who I am, I could hardly even explain, because theological student didn't mean anything to him at that point. But every Friday I went. But you see that first Friday evening when I got home, and I'm ashamed to say this now at my age, but when I got home, I stripped off every piece of clothing and I bathed because I thought I would get cancer. That, that, that was where we were at then. But I faithfully went every Friday. And then one Friday when I went, his bed was empty. And the nurse said to me, he's gone. And I'm like, he's what? And of course, this, we didn't have cell phones. This is 79, 80, 80. We didn't have cell phones. There was no, I, I heard of this passing upon arrival. And I stood riveted because here was someone who in the last maybe four or five weeks, I'd been able to just be there, to just be present and just to care. And I wondered if he died alone. Did the nurses surround him? And I'm saying, I have never forgotten that case. There have been many others since. But I've never forgotten that because I knew then the need to offer care to people at that point in life. At that, at that place where you move between life and death. And the thoughts and the emotions and the needs that they have at that stage. And so wherever we're caring for people, whether it's in the home, the hospital, or it's palliative care, we need to make sure that they are comfortable. I want to say also that people are seeking, constantly seeking. And sometimes as Christians, we tend to believe that we are the only ones that offer pastoral care. But no, whether it is the rabbi, at the synagogue, and we, we see this in the war. Don't let it not be lost on you that the rabbis are offering pastoral care in context. The imam is offering, pa, pa, I'm, and I'm calling it pastoral care. We might want to drop the word pastoral and just say care. They are there burying, dealing with grief counseling, dealing with the pain and suffering of persons in Israel and in Palestine. They, they, they Christian pastors are in Maine dealing with the victims. And every religion has the spiritual leader who stands in the gap when there is pain. 
I want to say that because we are more than physical, our souls struggle. And in that struggle, we have the persons who help us along the way. We also have resources. And so whether it is the Bible, for, for those who believe in Jesus Christ, or whether it is the Quran, or the Torah, or the Bhagavad Gita, whatever it is, there is a holy book that is there for these moments that we go through. And I believe that no religion should ever think that the other religion does not do the best for persons in their moment of grief. And as a, as a Christian pastor, it is never lost on me the importance of other religions and what they do on behalf of those who believe. Because as human beings, this nexus of our body, mind, and spirit is the God nexus because God created us as we are human, made in the image and likeness of God. And so wherever we worship or whatever we read, and for those who are atheists or Buddhists, there is something about a force that you may conceive of, but we are more than just what you're looking at. And what is inside of us appeals or causes us to appeal to the divine. So when we reach that moment in sickness and in death, we can find a resource for what we need. And the struggle of the soul is real regardless of who we are. I want to say that the care of the soul involves that spiritual engagement, that time for reflection, that time for meditation, for fasting, or for some people it might be to do the Hajj, or to give alms, or to give an offering, or a tithe, or to perform the sacraments. Whatever it is that you do within the sphere of religion, it, they all lead to this connection. So why do you worship? Why do you pray? It is a consistent desire to connect with God. So, if, if we are working in such a space, then we must ask ourselves the question, what happens when pastoral care becomes real? I want to suggest that the pastors in context and, you know, I, I am really advocating that medical um, institutions create a space there for the care of the patient that includes a pastoral presence. That's, that's what I'm advocating for. And to allow for the use of quietness, so a space of quietness, a space where the persons, the patient, can have someone who listens intently to them. The doctors listen, and the doctors can answer the question, am I going to die? The pastoral caregiver, on the other hand, will answer, when I die, what happens? So we need the medical information but we also need information that satisfies the, the soul questions. And so sometimes persons need to be led to forgiveness. Persons need to be led to release some, some pain that they have carried for 40 years of their lives. Some people need to reach back and to talk through and to make sure that all is well. Some people need to understand what is going to happen with the life insurance and the pension and the, you know, the will. And so you have your lawyers who surround you and tell you what to do or what not to do. So all of these converge at that moment. But I think that for most persons, the critical answer is, 
or question I should say is, what is going to happen when I die? And this is where pastoral care comes. And that pastoral presence speaks to the minist- what I call the ministry of presence, the listening, the empathy, the reflection, the responding to the God questions, confidentiality, and a consistency. Have you noticed that if someone is in the hospital, the first few days they're in the hospital, everybody visits? Then it becomes six weeks in the hospital and one visitor in four days. Because people get tired of coming to Health City or HSA or wherever. And then, and then, when the person dies, the family is surrounded. And you know what I have discovered? Most of the times, people surround the family out of curiosity. And if we could say it in the colloquial, people just fast. And they, they want to know what killed them. And what they said, what was the last thing they said. And some are there to hear if their name is on the will. But, but I don't mean to trivialize the conference. Please, I'm sorry. But the, the truth is that in those moments, We really need to be surrounded in the best way possible and to help people in that transition. So, what do we provide? We provide a sense of hope. Um, We provide a patient experience that enables persons to be comfortable and to respond to the medication. Because if sometimes, and I, I give way to the doctors on this, sometimes if you're not at peace, no matter what the medication can do for you, it can't do it because your mind and your whole well-being is just not in that place. So, so when there is someone or a team that provides that kind of support, it allows for the body to respond better to what the doctors are saying and to what is being done. The, at the points of crisis, we want to suggest that family members understand and surround. But most families are not able to do that. And so sometimes there is confusion and anger, sometimes scorn, Sometimes hatred. Sometimes family members get tired. Have you ever had someone with a broken limb in your context and you have to assist them along the way? Or someone who is recovering from an illness or they've had chemotherapy or radiation and they're just weak and listless and as a family member, you're just tired. I think sometimes we, we won't honestly say so, but how we treat them suggests that there is a weariness. Sometimes we are, we are so preoccupied with our own selves that we don't have the space within us to extend that care. And so I would say that at those points, call for the help that you need because there are caregivers around who can support you. The, the real crunch comes and, you know, as when, when your child is ill, um, and I, I watch, I watch the, the advertisement a lot, Shriners and the care for children with cancer, and the children who are born with severe challenges, and how families journey with that, sometimes from birth and before birth throughout life, and the kind of support that has to be given to those patients, to those children, and the kind of support that is needed by the family. When when we face those moments, I want to suggest that 
our prayer life, our love, our fellowship must come to the table. There has to be an important space for listening, awareness, empathy, reflection, responding to the God questions, and confidentiality. These slides are fooling me. Right. One of the one of the the challenges that we have as a society is that we don't deal well with grieving. And I've just simply used the Kubler-Ross classic outline where take here in the Cayman Islands, it's a Friday night, there is a motor vehicle accident and the person dies. If you visit the hospital, most of the persons there are in shock. There's a lot of tears, crying, noise, confusion, and people converge in the space. And for days, some will remain in that shock. Then some will go into denial, it's not true. They still expect to know that the person is alive, the person is coming home. And some people begin to bargain. God, if you do this for me, if you keep the person alive, I will go to church every Sunday. You know where people bargained a lot? During Hurricane Ivan. For those of you who were here. When the roof was coming in or the waters were rising, people went into overdrive and they promised God. I mean, if God ever pull out that list now. We made so many promises that Monday, Sunday night into Monday into Tuesday. The following Sunday after the hurricane, John Gray Memorial Church had the highest attendance ever. Because everybody came to church. And everybody testified about their change and their commitment to Jesus Christ. And then the money came in to reinsure, to buy the new car. The, the money came in for the house. I haven't seen them since. But in that crisis, and that's okay. In that crisis, people made a lot of bargaining. Did a lot of bargaining. And then there are some people who get into this phase of anger. And sometimes it is directed towards the doctors. And I'm being very careful here because I know you have liability insurance just for those purposes. That sometimes the anger directed towards the medical profession comes as a stage of grieving. They also get angry at the pastor. You ever preach the wrong sermon? Or the organist played the wrong tune for the hymn. Or the undertakers didn't get the lipstick right. And people get angry. Because it's a phase of bereavement. Then they move to acceptance. And finally they begin to adjust life. And I should say that people move through these phases at different paces. So you might go through all five in one day. Done, done. She's dead, she's gone. I'm getting married next week. Or you may take a lifetime to move through. And sometimes you go back. You go back to the phases. In this pastoral care, someone is there to guide you along the way. When the door is closed and all is said and done, people come back to, how do I manage? What do I do? 
and people begin to call upon others to assist them along the way. And it's interesting that in dealing with some persons after the death of a relative, their primary question is, what has happened to them? Did they go to heaven or did they go to hell? Have you ever come across people asking you that? And some people feeling guilty that they did not speak enough about God to the person. And so it takes a while for some to adjust. But pastoral care can help persons through those pathways. I want to close. I know I have a few minutes, but I, I want to close with some concerns that I have. And these concerns, and I'm treading very, very cautiously here, but I want to ask the question, who cares for the medical practitioners? Who provides support for them? When they lose a patient, who cares? When they have been working double shifts and survive on coffee, who cares? When they lose family members, who cares? I want to suggest that in this whole presentation, the same pastoral care needed by the patient is also needed for the medical professionals. And I want to say that it is beyond salaries. I think here in the, I have not done the research, but I want to think that the medical professionals here receive some of the highest salaries worldwide. Correct me if I'm wrong. But it's not that. It's not your salary that matters. What matters include your work environment, collegiality, support, respect from the patient, and also from the administrators and respect from the public. I want to suggest that each medical practitioner, regardless of where you fall in that mix, not, not that you should be worshipped and adored, but that you should be held in such high esteem because of the God-given role that you play in alleviating suffering in helping persons along the way. And I stand with you in the work that you do because there is a sacredness of life. There's an art and a science towards and in what you do. And you come to the table with your old, do first, do no harm. And I stand here as someone who have benefited greatly from what you do, and I stand here in support of you. Thank you.